video tutorial on confidence intervals on the mean. Actually, part two. This is for Statistics 321 at Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay, so we're picking up right where we left off with our other video. So if you haven't watched it, you might want to jump back to it and see where we're at because I don't have time to go through everything. So uh, from the last video, we defined the population. We have our sample size. We have a null plot here that we're going to plot our results in. And we went through and generated data and created confidence intervals on them. And using this confidence interval, we actually plotted our results. So each one of these lines is a confidence interval from a sample, random sample of size 100. And you can see some of them did not hit the blue line, and but most of them do. And when it hits the blue line, that is a success. So what we want to do now is see if we can't get this to do a little bit more. And really what we're trying to do here is learn about the if statement. We've been playing with loops before. Now it's time to add some logic in. Okay, so we need to put in an if statement. So, and this is going to be a complex if statement. So we're going to do if, and then we're going to put our logic statement, which is we have test one, one is less than mu zero. So this would be uh, the lower bound is actually less than mu. And test one, two, the upper bound is actually greater than mu. Okay, so that means we actually land up in the interval. We land in the interval. So what we'll do is we'll put curly braces here, and we're going to put our segments in here. This would be when we actually hit the actual blue line, okay? Because the lower bound is less than the true value, and the upper bound is le greater than the true value, which would mean is a success. Here I'm going to put else, because it's saying... If this is true, the statement is true, then do whatever is here. If it's not true, that's the else part, then do whatever is here. And I'm really not going to change too much. All I'm going to do is close this off, and I'm going to change the color. I'm going to change the color to red so that we can see when we missed. Okay? So this is the first thing I'm going to do. Let's go through and run this and see if it works. I'm just going to run it all the way from the top, run it down, and sure enough, when I zoom in, I can see the red ones that missed. And I can actually count them. One, two, three, four, five out of 100. So 95 of them were right, which is 95% confidence. Now, remember, this is a simulation, which means you can do it again. Uh, you can do it again. And in this one, you can see this one missed and this one missed. So 98% of them were right. Uh, but on average, it'll be 95%. Uh, based off of the theory that we have. Okay, so let's do one other thing, is we want to create one other container here, which is what I want to call correct. I'm going to call it correct. And when I start it off, I'm going to put it at zero. Okay, and if inside this if statement, you can put lots of other statements, and that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. We don't need to demonstrate uh, everything, but we can add more than one statement in here. So correct one will be equal to correct one plus one. So basically all I'm doing is indexing it up. So I'm counting the number of times we've gotten this correct. And then what I want to do is I want to put down here at the bottom correct one and I want to divide it by 100. Why? Because I have 100 of these uh, that I ran in my simulation here. Okay, so this is the first thing we want to do. We want to see how often we get this correct, and then we want to start playing around with a few things. So we're using the if else, we've got the correct, we run this, and we can see on this one, we've gotten 94% correct. So one, two, three, four, five, six are out. And that's where it's really handy when these red ones fall out. The other thing we might want to change is, is how does this change if I change the sample size? What happens to the intervals? So what happens if I change the sample size down to, let's say, 50? Okay. I can run this. Uh, what happened to the intervals? They seem to have gotten wider, but I'm still correct 94% of the time on this one. If I run it again, I'm now 95% correct, uh, as I see down here, and you can see what happens. What happens if I crank it even lower, my sample size even lower? Uh, how about 25? 
If I use 25, I can run this. And, oh, my intervals are, my space that I have to plot it in is getting a little off. But I missed it three times here. But now notice how wide these intervals are getting. And that's part of what we're interested in, is not only how often it's correct, because that was in our list. We want it to be as correct as often, but we also want to have the narrowest interval uh, as possible. And this is what this is giving us is the narrowest interval that we can come up with, and we can prove that mathematically, but right now let's not worry about it. The other thing that we may want to change, uh, because you say, well, you know, we've kind of stacked this up to be successful, um, you can change what happens to lots of things. We can actually change the confidence interval. We don't need to actually keep the confidence level the same. So we can take the conf level, and we can make it whatever we want, as long as it's a number between 0 and 1. So don't put 99 in there. Put 0 0.99. Then when I run, let's, let's see what happens. Oh, you can see the intervals are even wider now, and this one was correct 97%, even though I asked for 99. It's random, so things are going to change. Uh, and this one, all of them were correct, but look how wide these are. These are very wide now. So the wider the interval is going to be controlled by your sample size and your confidence level. The higher the confidence level, the wider your interval. The smaller the sample size, the wider your interval. All right, so this gives you some sense of how to think about a confidence interval. Each individual interval may or may not be correct. So let's put this at 90 so we get a lot of them that are not correct. Each individual interval may or may not be correct, right? So these red ones were not correct. All the green ones were correct. They actually captured the value, meaning they're correct. So when we think about this, the idea is, is that the method we're using works 90% of the time, 95% of the time, 98% of the time, 99% of the time. Whatever we choose, we can choose how often the method is right. However, on any individual interval, we don't know whether the interval is correct or not. And that's one of the most frustrating things for people is we can say the method works 99% of the time, but we don't know whether it worked on this particular instance of it. And uh, I usually joke around with my students and I say, on a test, if it asks, is this interval correct? You can actually write down the answer that you've always wanted to write on a test and get it right, which is, I don't know. How often have you been able to write on a test the words, I don't know, and get it actually correct? All right, so we're gonna move on to the next video where we start to play with the functions in general for Tests on proportions, tests on means, uh, paired tests, all of those, put them together. So let's move to the next video.